come up with this so everyone can like jump in with ideas or suggestions at certain points. So feel free to just shout out, raise your hand or type in the chat. To begin with, I thought it would be nice if we all just quickly go around and introduce ourselves and say what we do and where we work. Um, so I'll start. I'm Harriet, a data analyst here at Count. Um, I can call out as it goes around my screen. So Pierre, do you want to go? Sure. So I'm Pierre. I work at uh, Zigzag. We have a puppy training uh, app. Uh, I joined in May uh, this year and I'm data and analytics lead. So I'm trying to build uh, the entire data platform uh, for to, to enable my team to uh, get one unique source of uh, truth. So I guess this, uh, yes, today's session will be uh, very useful to me. Great. Um, Doug? Oh, yeah, um, I'm Doug. Uh, I run the data team, team three at Modulus. Modulus is a um, construction technology startup. Um, we build buildings and uh, help architects and designers design buildings, uh, is the theory. Uh, relatively new to count, but yeah, on the learning curve. Great. Um, Juan? Hey team, uh, my name is Juan. Um, uh, I'm working now with Omnipresent, uh, you know, the remote hiding platform. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the business improvement team. Uh, and, you know, my role is basically, um, you know, we're just initiating, you know, with this, all this data journey, you know, we have been able to uh, build some cool stuff and count. And now the the information it's quite difficult to gather from different platforms that we're using right now so my job now is to like to consolidate and just like you have said like having one single source of truth and uh our goal is that uh, to become great uh robert yep so i'm uh i actually have my own company i'm a consultant um so i do a lot of uh High tech stuff. I uh, work with some of the larger companies around uh, data analysis, their business, business plans, uh, go to market strategy, uh -huh. engineering for uh, uh, EMS companies like electronic manufacturing services companies. Cool. Um, Anastasia? Uh, and this, uh, I'm the analytics chapter lead at Officeing, which is a tech recruitment platform. And I would say we're quite data centric, but we still find that people dive in and try and validate that the numbers that they're seeing is correct. Um, so that's why I was keen to participate in this workshop today. Great. Um, John? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I thought Robert was almost going to say verbatim exactly what I what I did, <laughs> except my focus has been across uh, B2B SaaS companies, uh, mostly on the small side, and then trying to help them um, think about uh, consolidating their data, uh, getting sort of a good data pipeline. And then the, the thing I love about Count is that it's forcing now to get to a point of collaboration between business users and some of the technical folks that has been harder in the past. And uh, that's kind of why I'm here. And then just trying to figure out more and more ways to educate people um, as to the importance of this. Um, and Nitesh? Hey, so very similar to Robert and John, um, I'm an independent consultant and I support medium-sized businesses with sort of building out their pipeline as well as a bit of the analysis when when I can help. Great. Um, hi, Jose. We've just been doing quick introductions before we start, and everyone's gone, but would you like to do a quick introduction? OK. <laughs> uh, I'm Jose. I've been using Count for maybe like a month or two now. And I have a small startup, and we do payment processing for people who have businesses in Instagram, WhatsApp, uh, mostly Central American customers. And yeah, I want to figure out how to use count better because it's pretty cool. Nice meeting you all. Um, and then I guess everyone knows Taylor, but <laughs> I don't know if I've met everybody. Um, but yeah, nice to meet you guys and Taylor. Um, 
I'm head of product at Count, um, but I've been analyst data scientist for most of my career. Um, so I've got a lot of uh, experience with with this topic today. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Great. So I think that's everyone. I will just share my screen. Is that working? Yeah, I think it's good. Great. So in the workshop today, we'll cover off how to build analysis people trust. And we'll do that in two halves. So looking at firstly why there's a lack of trust. And then in the second half, we'll go on to look at three ways in which you can start building trust in the analysis that you do. So to start with, um, why is there a lack of trust? To look into this initially, I thought it would be good for us to share some ideas of what lack of trust looks like to you. So any experiences that we've had here that demonstrate when you've had that lack of trust, when you've made a dashboard or analysis that other people you get pushed back from. Um, so for example, I could go first, where, when, where I used to work, I was helping the marketing team and was asked to make a dashboard with loads of different metrics, which are every possible thing you could do. And then found out a few weeks later it wasn't really being used because all of the people within the marketing team couldn't understand all the acronyms although i was asked to include like lifetime value and things like that because no one knew how it was calculated no one looked at the numbers or trusted it um so yeah that's an example i had does anyone else have any times that they've been frustrated by this kind of thing lack of lack of trust and uh, several examples we've had in our business is uh, they go back to their old excel spreadsheets <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah. i have a similar experience around marketing um where I, I think it's from as a consumer of some of the marketing um, analytics that are produced and i think in in the b2b world where there's a lot of salesforce use or just crm use you find that um QAing of the data, how data has been manipulated either inside of Salesforce or outside of Salesforce is highly problematic. And having some measure of audit trail around that is is so critical. So I think I find that you know a lot of things can get pulled into um, PowerPoint presentations. And then there's really you know, maybe a link to a, a report, which is the source in Salesforce, but there is very little understanding of how the QA process went. Yes, that is a classic. <laughs> yeah, I think it got, um, when I was working at a company before Count, um, as part of like a central data team, and we worked a lot with uh, engineers, and the engineers are obviously very technical, so they just wanted, you know, raw data to look at stuff, but it got so bad, they just eventually like quit using the central analytics team completely. So they were like, we just don't work with you guys because we don't trust anything that you put out. So they kind of officially cut off. So that's, I think, like, as bad as it can get is when they just kind of turn away from metrics completely. Hopefully you guys haven't had that, but I think that's one of the worst cases of how a lack of trust can, like, completely deteriorate the relationship. Yeah, Jose, uh, would you like to explain what you wrote? <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess my example was more mechanic, but I've I've seen it often that someone gives you like a hundred line SQL statement, and and I've seen it that with count it, it's pretty easy to just see intermediate steps. Before it was a big thing to just look through a huge query, and see what went wrong or how it's working. Yeah, that can be a real nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, I think sometimes things also like get lost in translation when views are shared. So you might build it with a specific um, purpose and audience in mind. And then another team uses it and you don't even know that they're using it and they don't know all the filters applied at the back end. And then they'll come to you like, why doesn't this match the source of truth view? And it's because it's saying something totally different, even though it's LTV, it's like LTV for something specific. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, great. Does anyone else have any other ones before we move on? No? Cool. Um, okay, so that was looking at ways that you've experienced lack of trust as the analyst or the person that's made the report. Um, but now what about if we think about if we were the stakeholder instead? So, for example, in this situation, maybe we're the head of marketing and we've been told that we've got certain KPIs to reach, which are revenue and number of sales. And so we ask our analytical team to make a dashboard to track those metrics. And so then they go away and a few days later come back with a dashboard, for example, something a bit like this, which has everything we asked for. So we've got the two main KPIs. It's got some other key metrics that we want to see and also like a monthly and weekly split. But then if we think that we're the head of marketing now coming to look at this, we might be faced with a lot of questions now that we've seen it. So shout out if you've got any suggestions too. But for example, maybe we see this big increase in May and we're like, whoa, well, do I even trust the source of the data? Like, was that a real increase? Has June now dropped off when it should have been increasing or was May like an issue with the data? Um, something else we might think is, I'm a bit concerned that June's low in case it should have been going up like May was but I don't know where to go next and what to look into. So like looking at these monthly trends, maybe the biggest change is in lost users. There's a big jump here, so I should be concerned about that. But what is a lost user? I've forgotten if I was ever told or I was never told. So I don't know if this is a concern. Um, so I've come up with some ideas here that I've just mentioned. Um, for example, how can you explore the data now I see that there's an issue, but I don't know where to go from this, how to take action as a result. I don't know if there's anything else that anyone can think of that they might feel if they were head of marketing that have come in and seen this report. I don't know if not, it's quite a hard <laughs> question to do. Um, cool. So if we move on from that, we can think of these kinds of mistrust in both that you've received as an analyst or that you feel as the stakeholder and group those in three buckets. So one is generally a data quality issue in terms of do I trust the number, like it feels wrong, but I don't know if it's like the analytics behind how that works. Another one is lack of context. So what to do with the results of those numbers and what is it showing me like revenue's gone up but why what can I do to fix it and finally a general stakeholder analyst relationship so if the report isn't showing what the stakeholder really needs so being able to build that relationship around the trust and the numbers actually being useful numbers to see um at this point are there any other types of mistrust that people think could be grouped as a bucket or we happy with these three. Cool. Um, so then thinking of those as general types of mistrust, we can come to some ways that you could create trust. Some of these being requirement gathering. So making sure at the start when you've been asked for some kind of report or analysis, really making sure you understand why. And I think it was mentioned earlier, also the purpose so that people have a reason to come in and use the report so make sure you really get that information from someone um secondly the business context and making sure the layout reflects the context so it's easy for someone to come in and understand how those numbers fit in relation to the business questions trying to answer and then a third way is intentionally creating strong relationships with stakeholders so trust doesn't come immediately once you share a report someone's not going to immediately trust everything they see, but it's more comes with time. So through lots of feedback and collaboration and working together, so the stakeholder can really understand where all data is coming from, that part of the journey, so that the more you make reports and analysis, the more they can trust it over time. Um, so that's the other three points we're going to cover a bit more now in the second half. So... 
in terms of requirement gathering it's making sure that you make time to come up with questions that are going to be useful for both of you to make sure that the stakeholder has everything that they need to take action because all analysis and reports are designed to be able to inform and cause action in some way so if we continue with the earlier example where we're the analyst and we've been asked for a dashboard tracking those kpis here are some questions that we've come up with that you might include in a requirement gathering dashboard or like template and this could be in any way that you do it but the idea is that you'd work together with your stakeholder to find out exactly what's useful and why it's useful so that it can be used in the right context so in this example there's a couple of questions i'll just go through it briefly but the idea is that the things i've circled are things we didn't know before so this is additional takeaways that we didn't have that now we've got because we've gone through this together and it doesn't have to take long um so our initial request was just a dashboard to track the numbers but actually if we dig into the purpose and why the stakeholder wanted it they want the kpis but they also want to be able to identify areas to improve performance so they want to be able to know where to take action and where to focus on next um some other things that are good to bear in mind are like triggers are there any particular questions to answer this i think is a really useful one important one how it's currently done so at the moment your stakeholder will be doing some like finding the numbers from somewhere and so where is it and why are they asking now for this new dashboard or analysis and once you know those problems you can make sure that they're not on the next one <laughs> glad you like it um so crucially in this example they already had a dashboard say in looker but no one's using it because one is they don't know where the data is coming from so they don't know if it's accurate and another one is they don't know how to act on it so they can see if they're on track with their kpis but they don't know how to fix it and obviously their goal is to increase those metrics um this one i also think is really useful so we know the primary user that's the person that's asked for it and in this case is the head of data and so they've got clear goals that they want out of this dashboard but like you mentioned earlier i think aniska um it's other people that come in as well so it's good at this point to think of who those secondary users might be so for example i've said that the cmo wants to come in occasionally to check like they want to know that his marketing team is on track with the targets so they just want to see top level results and know that it's on track or not on track and another type of user could be the members within the marketing team so they're very different because they want the detail they want to know how their particular marketing channel and the effects that that has influences the overall marketing team's goal so they want to be able to use the same report but see a lot more detail so to make it useful we want to make sure that we're covering those different use cases and again thinking of all of the possible main secondary users it's great to do at this initial stage before you like wireframe it out um and this is quite a nice one too thinking of success metrics so knowing whether an analysis report has been a success so for a dashboard it's probably regular use so if it's designed to be a weekly dashboard that they use at their meeting to check in a month later has it been used weekly are people maybe commenting on it using post-it notes like interacting with it in a way that you expect and then if they're not it's a good thing to check why so that the next time you do a report you make sure that that same issue doesn't crop up again so that's a really useful one for like the iterative process for next time and again that's building trust because the more it's actually used the more trust there is that the next time it's going to be a success too um and you might want to have flag concerns um so there are some suggestions that we have that are useful things to have at a requirement gathering phase is there anyone else that has done this kind of thing that has suggestions of any other requirements that are useful to get at this stage before starting we have something similar in the in the form of a document <coughs> rather than the more visual template like this but um yeah how, however you do it yeah understanding why you're doing what you're doing 
as, asking the five five whys or however many whys it takes to get to the real to the real reason uh, is, is a key thing. Um, uh, but when we start talking about solutions, we start getting into things like opportunity solution trees. But yeah, you don't always need you don't always need to get into that level of complexity. Um, if you if you go and look at anything that talks about data products, then you you get some good advice in terms of uh, how to set yourself up more for success by think, thinking the product way. Um, yeah, this, this is a good good version of it, I think. Yeah, definitely. Never really thinking of the whys. Yeah. I think this, like when we set out to build uh, one of the like key um, reporting requirements or dashboards, we follow this approach, but when it's more of an ad hoc thing, we don't always follow this approach. So I'm wondering if there's like a mini version of this. And then uh, a second comment is, this is great. And then when it actually comes to building out the visualizations and like how to share the information with users, that's often where we get a lot of like back and forth with stakeholders and that's sometimes time consuming. And I don't know if that's something we want to include here. Like maybe this is the type of solution and this is the way um, you want it visualized, which is nice and calm because we can play around with that without doing too much development work. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. At this stage, it's good to know what they're imagining the solution would look like so that you can try and feed into what they're expecting to see and what will be useful for them to see. Yeah, definitely. Um, great. So then if we've done our requirement gathering and we know that we're confident that it's going to be useful for them as well as what they've actually asked for, we can think about how the layout would be useful to make sure that, as we just said, it makes sense for that stakeholder in terms of the wider business context of what they what they need it for. So again, if we think of the same example where we're analysis, oh yeah, it is a template if anyone would like it. <laughs> um, so if we think of the same example, previously we had a dashboard which had the metrics at the top, but now that we know that we also want to show how you can act on those metrics. A good example that we could use is a metric tree instead. So here we've got the same metric, so revenue and number of sale, but we're including all of the other metrics that were in the dashboard, but in this tree so we can see how they all influence each other, um, which is a really great way of then making it more actionable. So if you notice, for example, there's a big drop here in needs, this is the issue. And that's the thing that's affecting overall the number of sales or the revenue. Um, so the head of marketing knows that that's the area to focus on and to ask their team to look more into that. Um, in terms of this layout, there's four interesting things that I think are good to call out. One is that we've got context. So up here, including some kind of description to explain what the dashboard's for is great for those secondary users when they come in. So if someone randomly finds it and pops in, they know the purpose of the dashboard, what to look for and how to use it. And so that just immediately avoids that confusion and people can trust that that's what the numbers are showing and the purpose of those numbers. Um, a second thing that I mentioned before is the overall layout. So what's useful for this particular context for the different users that might come in, one is, if you're, for example, the top level CMO who just wants to come in occasionally look top level, they can come in and just focus on this revenue number of sales and check it's on track. Yeah, all good, they can leave again. Um, or if you want more detail, you can look back at how the initial metrics are affecting change. And as well within each metric, we can see that it goes down as a gradient. So we've got the very top level numbers up here, the month and month changes, and then a bit more detail with the graph over time but it includes if someone wants even more detail. So they're like, wait, but how did you calculate revenue here? You've also got included exactly how it's calculated and the source data. So you could then, like someone could come in and see how it is calculated. And then if they want to like do some more analysis from there or something like that, 
that's very easy and possible to do. Um, so it's a great way of having different levels of detail all in one place. So it serves multiple different people. Um, and finally, what's good about this kind of layout is it really encourages collaboration so that people can come in and add comments and questions, but also different people from different teams might have different insights. So someone from the marketing team might understand something more than the analysts would because they're the ones that deal with marketing all the time. Um, so an interesting example down here, in the previous dashboard, I mentioned that the lost users seemed like it was going up a lot. So maybe that was the biggest cause for concern. But actually, from this dashboard and being able to see comments easily, it's a lagging indicator. So it's not actually an issue. So that's not something that the team should be spending time on. And again, maybe we forget what a lagging indicator is. So we can check in, I mean, a loss rate is. So we can check in here and find that it's a lagging indicator. Um, so there are some reasons why this layout is possibly for the purpose of this head of data who wanted, head of marketing who wanted this report gives more use. There's, they can take more from it. Um, yes. So then there's also other types of questions you might be asked. So this one was revenue, was a metric based. So it made sense for it to be in a metric tree. But some other examples that you might get, um, we've laid out down here. So maybe if you're asked for some kind of user journey or marketing flow, that's great to have some kind of flow chart. Like we've just said, a metric tree is really useful if it's metric focused, making sure that there's a comparison so you can see both options if it's an A-B test. And again, with the visuals as well, you could see what's being changed. Um, and a funnel could be useful for some kind of customer funnel. Does anyone here use any of these right now and find them useful? Or do you think there's any that you're like, I definitely want to give that a go? Yeah, I think the I think what you shared is specifically your layout looked really good and it made a lot of sense for for that use case. I feel the challenge I find is a lot of times the customer doesn't really know what they want. So they're like, yes, I want revenue figures. And then you give them that. And then they're like, oh, actually, I want these other three things. And even in the requirements gathering that, that we do, until they see it, that's when all the questions come. So I feel like one of the suggestions I heard before was that collaborative, bringing them into and doing it on the fly. I kind of like that. Yeah, sorry, I'm going off topic. But yes, thank you for sharing this. <laughs> no, I think that's definitely a really good point. That is the collaboration throughout to make sure that because when someone asks for something, like you say, they don't know what they want, but it's only once they start seeing it, do they realize they're like, no, nah, actually, that's not useful. <laughs> um, great. So then the final thing, which I guess we just mentioned a bit there as well, is about creating strong relationships. And one way to do that is through regular feedback. Like we said, to make sure that the output is useful and trusted is by having that process. And so initially we can do that through requirement gathering by getting together and both working at the same time to work out exactly what they need and why they think they need it. Then another good time to check in is early on after you initially prototype. So once you've got that kind of wireframe and that structure before too much data is in there, you can check it. And then finally at 80% completion is generally, we find a really good time. So you've done most of it before you spend time finishing the final bit get them to test it out, see if it is useful for the purpose that they think they want it for. Um, and we have an example here of how that can also save so much time. So this was someone who, before they used that process of like working together more collaboratively, it was the traditional flow of a stakeholder would make a request to the data team, the data team would spend some time working on it, then hand it back, then get feedback, and it's all very segmented and takes about three days whereas they found that afterwards when it was a much more collaborative approach the whole time it was just so much quicker as well and you get to the end result like you said you're able to make those changes early on at this point if you're like oh actually that output isn't why i'm after i want a different kind of format it's all a lot quicker when you're just doing it together um so i thought that was really interesting to see that it 
can make such a big impact. Um, and another great thing about doing the collaborative work at the same time is that you can deep dive a lot easier and dig into questions that matter and you, because you're doing it at the time with the expert, like the subject expert. So if it's a marketing issue, you're dealing with them. Um, you can dig into it more. So for example, this is like a pop out that you might do if the head of marketing saw that big drop in leads. So they're like, what's going on? It's much quicker if you can then dive in and look at it together. So you might have some initial ideas and they are the ones that would know that they've been experimenting with different platforms maybe. So they're like, have a look into this because I know that that could be an issue. So you could come up with a few ideas together, um, validate, and then it's very quick for you to make some graphs of the key things that you've suggested. But what's particularly useful is because you're doing it together, for example, here, they'd be able to give you the relevant knowledge. If you're like, that looks wrong, is the data wrong? They could say, oh no, we like did a test here and then we did a test here. So you can work out with both of your knowledge what the actual issues are and what the next steps that the head of marketing could go and look into. And another great thing about being able to do these kind of deep dives is that, like we said before, for people that don't, that aren't there in the process, so they weren't part of that collaboration, by making sure that you share it somewhere with the main dashboard, if someone else comes in here and they're like, oh no, leads are dropping loads, what's going on? They can look into that themselves. So it means that you're closing the loop for lots of other people too. Um, which is the kind of thing you could do not with count as well, but it's just easy being able to put it there. Um, so I guess that also is a good way of making trust because they know that it's quick to look into these issues and everyone can see how you've looked into it more and what the next steps are. Um, yeah, so that is kind of some actionable ways that you can create trust in these three main steps so for example using that template or a similar one and making sure that you always do that at the start of projects by looking at business layout and how you can make the layout relevant to the context that it's in and then creating strong relationships as something that's like an iterative thing over time just by communicating more and working more together um yeah so that is a summary of the three things we've covered and then here we've come up with three ways that you could immediately start to try and build trust within your business so for example in terms of requirement gathering even if you're partway through a project now you could think about take a pause and think about that you understand who's using it why they're using it and why they need it now and if you're not sure on any of those answers like take a break and go check in to make sure that what you're making is for the purpose that it's needed. Um, in terms of business context and layout, you could have to think about one that you're building at the moment. So is there one that you're currently doing in like a traditional dashboard way that might be more useful, for example, in the metric tree so that they can see more clearly what's impacting what. And finally, in terms of feedback and building that relationship, it could be that you just check in with a stakeholder soon and see what concerns they currently have with either any current dashboards that are live or something that you're currently building into analysis and start getting their feedback early on on what's important to them um yeah so that is a summary i don't know if anyone from going through all of that has any thoughts on that they've seen anything today that they might start doing or that they were doing before that's working well uh, there's one point for me that um, uh, intrigued me. It's when you were showing about the the different workflows of over three days or one hour. Um, the the thing that I'm not sure if I have a question with this. Maybe I'm asking for uh, asking if anyone had had this experience before. But I used to work this way, really gathering requirements, working for one week, presenting the dashboard or work in progress, and iteratively uh, building the dashboard this way and 
uh, in my last job, I realized that because it was taking too much time, I started to try to, we were looking with, working with Looker with a fairly clean data model in the back, fairly clean data models in the background, which was allowing me to start building on the fly uh, the dashboard. And, but what I realized, although I was really excited about the approach at first, what I realized was that very often I ended up in a situation where I was building something and it was like, oh, that looks completely odd. Wait, okay, we'll park this for now. I'll need to get back to the data engineering time or uh, team or um, have a look at the uh, data quality. Uh, or building something on the fly was actually raising more questions and kind of uh, steering us away from the main purpose of the, of the meeting. And I ended up going back to just requirements gathering now and I'll work on my own and I'll come back uh, with the three days of practice. So yeah, I just, um, I'm not sure if anyone has, is it, is it maybe something I, I was doing wrong this way or is it the context that didn't help me in this case? Um, any, any ideas? <laughs> yeah, I think we've, we've run into that ourselves internally quite a bit. Um, like trying to bring Ollie into a piece of analysis and trying to do it real time can get um, kind of distracting. I think what we've found is the point at which you bring someone in is really key. Um, I think I tried to do it like, let's say you've, you've kind of got it all finished and when you bring someone in, that's when you're doing like, oh, hey, can we like copy this and paste it and tweak this thing? Can we just drill down into this like two or three levels? So you're only kind of, you should only be going like one to two levels down versus, you know, let's say you've done like, again, back to that. Yeah, exactly. The 80% thing comes in. It's uh, I kind of like to think of it as like late stage differentiation, if you're familiar with that concept in like supply chain perspective. So you're only doing that last kind of 20% of stuff with them in real time. And you should feel very confident about everything you've done up to that point. Because if not, then yeah, you're going to be spending a lot of time being like, uh, I'm not sure. And then you've kind of gone backwards in terms of trust, right? Like if you can't answer that question really quickly, then they're even more reluctant to ask next time. So it is important when you bring someone in at that point. And I think that like 80% stage is a nice place where you're like, we're just doing like the icing here. We're like helping you drill down that last bit, but most of it's done. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So I I had a question. Um, so I'm I'm using count a bit more for for like exploratory data analysis as well as if there's ever an investigation. I kind of they have a dashboarding tool in the business, and we generally keep to that for you know just keeping the entire company aligned. I'd love to know your opinion on this and how. You suggest so for example in the example you've shared you know there was a clear dip and then that broke out into an investigation and the insights were there i'd love to know how you recommend count be used generally just out of sheer curiosity yeah you mean kind of in relationship with a bi tool yeah yeah um we've we see it a couple different ways um we most of our customers do have a BI tool. Um, so we do see it as like, there are benefits, right? There's, there's a handful of reporting features that count doesn't have, you know, like click-based filtering and that kind of stuff. So I think for things that have, in my mind, a very clear shared context where you maybe within the company have already established this kind of like, what is this report? How do we use it? all that stuff is already clear, then I think using a traditional BI tool is, is perfect for that. Like it has features that are meant for a lot of people to be looking at the same thing and be able to kind of slice things differently or or drill down or click that, click this bar and you have like drill down kind of filtering and that kind of stuff. I think that all makes sense. Uh, where those BI tools fail is in that investigation piece like you're talking about, like, okay, why did that go up? You can't really answer that there. or you know, things that are unclear, like Anziska saying, like, oh, you get something and people don't know, right? It's not this, we need a KPI report. It's just a, like, something's off. Can you help us figure out what's going on? And you're going to have to, like, peel through those questions layer by layer. Using this as a way to peel that back in a transparent way is really where we see it being most powerful because it's so flexible. It is so transparent. Um, you can obviously use it for reporting. Um, for things like metric trees that are different style. 
um, but it's kind of up to the company preference and how people feel interacting with those different types of reports. Does that answer the question? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Second account and as using it for collaboration, when someone only has viewing access to account board, I still find that the level of collaboration is limited because they can only add comments. That that will be changed soon. You'll be happy to hear. So, uh, okay. Okay, yeah. but it's like we it was a little bit limited. Um, and we just had to give everyone edit access because we wanted to collaborate a lot more closely and get them to play around with visualization. Because um, you don't get proper feedback. I think someone mentioned that you only get proper feedback once people actually start playing with things themselves. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, the kind of editor viewer line is going to be dependent on SQL in the future. So an editor will be someone who can edit SQL and a viewer can edit visuals even, uh, like use drag and drop features, can add sticky notes, can add, you know, hey, here's here's the funnel that we have in Miro. I could just paste it in and you can like see how it's laid out. Um, so yeah, we definitely see that, you know, a contributor can mean many different things. You can have contributors that aren't SQL editors. Um, so that's, yeah, we hear you, it's coming. I would, um, one kind of anecdote from our side uh, that Harriet can probably attest to. Um, a lot of these kind of ideas came from what happened to us uh, internally uh, just over the last few months where, um, you know, we're, we're a pretty small company, pretty young company. We were kind of early in our stage of getting reporting and stuff like that um, figured out. So um, one of Harriet's kind of initial tasks when she joined was to create some high level like metrics reports for us. Uh, and she was working with Ollie, our CEO, to do that. And how many, you created probably like three or four of them, right? Before like the last one stuck. Um, so we did a lot of like, we learned a lot in that process of doing things uh, that didn't work quite a few times. I think um, from my side, uh, you can also say like what ended up working, but I think it was like the gradation thing was huge, wasn't it? Like showing the metric in four different ways which I don't know if you, we put that in the, the newsletter a couple of weeks ago, but that kind of way of like showing the metric as a summary, showing how it's changed over time, showing it as like the row level detail, that built so much trust in those numbers because they could see it completely all the way through from like the row level things or like the things that they knew at the lowest level all the way to the highest. And that they, can, they almost read it like bottom up, but then once you trust it, then you read it top down, which is really nice. Um, I think that was huge. And then also getting him involved in a prototyping stage was really big to like, because we we laid stuff out, right? Like as that funnel. And then we got him in and he was like, oh, maybe we should rearrange it like this. Got him like invested that he was contributing to this. And now, I mean, he uses that thing. He's got both tabs open every day, doesn't he? Just like constantly look at them. Um, so those are like the big things, I think for us. I don't know, Harry, if you found anything else in that process you were more in the thick of it than i was but yeah i think particularly sharing early stage when you haven't spent a lot of time getting all the data so to begin with it would be like oh i want all of these things so i spent ages making sure that all the data was right and it was all there whereas actually by the end it was like oh maybe i want it like this and so i just get a little bit of the data in all of the right places and then see how useful that is and then spend time getting like the extra detail and that saves so much time so yeah, definitely sharing, but like Taylor said, sharing at the right time so that that's the moment where you're ready to have the input and can make the changes. Yeah, we made all the mistakes, so you guys don't have to. So, yeah. Even with, with like a requirement gathering and we do this whole process, but in the analytics scene, we have, often have repetition, right? So you have um, people doing the same thing for different stakeholders. And one way that we're looking to solve this is integrating with the metadata layer in DBT, where we define our metrics upstream and then allow people to just 
dynamically select those um, metrics in something like count instead of rewriting all the SQL to build out the metrics. Um, are you considering integrating with something like that? Yeah, yeah, that'll be coming kind of early next year. We'll be doing that. So, um, yeah, the DBT integration is getting more official, um, including metric layer or semantic layer, whatever they call it. Uh, yep. Yeah, I think one interesting kind of challenge I see coming out of this, the metric layer, semantic layer stuff that I don't really have a great solution to, it feels like the next kind of question to ask is in terms of documentation, like how documentation in terms of like a schema diagram and stuff, I just fundamentally don't think it works for a business user. Like that's kind of some of these ideas of like being empathetic and putting yourself in the stakeholder position schemas are very data centric way of looking at it and it doesn't root them in like the day to day way that they're interacting with this data like in their source systems and stuff like that. So how do you help them understand the model and be confident with it in a way that makes sense to them, I think would be something like, I don't know, I spend my spare time thinking about it, which is quite sad, maybe, but um, like, I think there's probably a very different approach that's going to be needed to make that kind of solution really work, I think. That's where if you know a lot of people we speak to are not on the data team, they can say like, oh sure, I, like my SQL skills are okay, but I have no idea how the data works to like actually do something with it. Like I don't understand the data model. So that's gonna be like a really big challenge, I think, coming up in general that the industry will need to face. It's just how do you help someone use it? More we, question. We, we've got <laughs> we've got definitely got that case going on because in in some cases, we're, we're effectively trying to digitize or create data models for business processes that haven't been digitized before. There's lots of stuff in construction which, uh, yeah, <laughs> relies on a lot of people's knowledge and a lot of spreadsheets. And so trying to come up with models and then bring those models to life. Um, yeah, here's a picture of your building. Here's, here's a picture of the modules that are in it. Here's a picture of the components. Uh, and then here's some actual data and numbers that go along with that. That's that's a, what we're really hoping Count will help us out, out with, with that collaborative view of the world and getting people to think about the stuff they're doing in a more da data literate way. Um, but yeah, the, we, we've catched it as an experiment to see how it goes. There's certainly not a, a, another BI tool out there that would let us do the same thing uh, and take current business processes and map them out and put the data alongside them with pictures, et cetera. So that's that's why we're betting on count right now. But I guess the whether that bet's going to pay off or not is still ongoing, but early signs are good. But, yeah, um, that's definitely, definitely should, um, keeping for us. Yeah, we should catch up. I'd love to know, like, yeah, how you're approaching it. I think it's just a really... You know, having the tool that enables you to do it is part of it, but so much of this is like in how you approach it and how you get the information and how do you like think about it. And I think, as you said earlier in the in the call, like what can we learn from product teams and, and thinking about this in terms of product to be more empathetic and like mm -hmm. shift the way that we, you know, discuss all of this in a way that makes more sense to the people that are increasingly having to use it. Yeah, but we're, we're... We're going to people and talking about building them data products, but it's really important to understand what they're trying to get out of it because they don't think of it as a data product. They think of it as this is my job, and I want to do it more yeah. more, effect, more effectively. Um, so yeah, to, turning it into the numbers and the and the, and the flow of the data. Um, yeah, they they need to see that, uh, particularly if we want to get them to do more of it themselves, basically. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's good. We do the same thing. Actually, we have like pictures of our product and say like, this is how it's represented in the data. It's actually really helpful. Like, um, our investors actually suggested that to us, and they tell all of their portfolio companies to do that uh, with product data. So it's actually like you laugh, but I think it's like one of the best ways to do it. But it's fascinating. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it must be a better way, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely powerful. If you can put put a picture of a wall panel, and then show the calculations next next to it, and yeah, some of this stuff is quite technical. So, 
um, yeah, the pe people that are in, in construction that they trust the drawings basically, so you can put the drawing alongside the lo uh, the logic. Um, yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, it's a it's a cool. I'll be thinking about it more in the coming the coming months. So. All right. Um, any closing comments, thoughts? No. Uh, if these things are useful, we'll probably keep keep doing them. Basically, people keep showing up. We'll keep trying them. Uh, if you guys have any suggestions for other things that might be helpful, maybe this idea of uh, kind of data documentation and transparency and that kind of stuff, maybe is a good one for, for next time. Um, but any anything else, you guys know where to find us if you've got suggestions for things that you think would be helpful for us to just think about and talk about. Um, Sorry, I have one. Are you sure this one? Campus? Ooh, oh yeah, sorry. that's that's what I was going to ask as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can show the was, yeah. Uh, Okay, thank you. Yeah, Harry can uh, send it out. Um, yeah, Harry, anything else you want to add? Um, I didn't think so. No, but that was very interesting. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> Thanks very much for having us. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Hope we see you at the next one. Yeah. And happy Christmas. <laughs> happy holidays. Happy holidays, guys. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. See you.